Okay, we're going to get started with our uh, November meeting, and our, our clinic today is uh, a clinic on the NMRA gauge, and a, a guy from um, Brian Bart is going to present it from, uh, he's a member of the Standards and Conformance Committee of the NMRA. He will be joining us by Zoom. As you've already heard, uh, I want to thank David Caranda for our new sound system. Uh, he ordered it last month. It cost, them, it cost the division about $400, but I think it's going to be well worth it. So it's, a, it's an improvement. Uh, most of that money came from the selling of those Clifton books or those railroad books a couple of months ago. So those donations or those contributions were put to good use. Um, so let's, uh, first of all, let's start off. Uh, I want to thank the Texas Western for uh, letting us host our meeting here. And I want to ask David Crumpton if he has any other announcements. Good morning. How many of you are here for the first time? Okay. It's great to have you here. It's great to have you here. Trapper, you've been here before. You just don't remember it. Okay, uh, again, welcome. We're glad you're here. Before you get out of here today, take a little tour around the layout. Every week there's more progress, more landscaping going on. So see if you can find the things that weren't here last month. And I think you're going to find a lot. The other thing I want to tell you is on the work table, there is a box of magazines, also a couple of plastic containers, and a little tray with some blades and various hobby knives. You're welcome to any of that. It's free. So take a look at any of that. And if it's something you can use, take it. Even that wooden tray that the blades and hobby knives are in, that tray is fair game too. So it was a donation to us. We didn't think it was something that would sell at the train show. So we thought, let's, let's let the guys at the division have a crack at it. So uh, again, welcome. Thank you for coming. David, before you leave, don't you have an open house coming up in the next oh, few weeks? Oh, thank you, Dick. We have an, a, what we call our Christmas holiday open house will happen on December the 16th. It's on a Saturday, December the 16th, 1 to 4. The club will be open. Santa Claus will be here. And we will be running probably five to seven trains at the same time. And we're asking folks that come, if you can bring an unwrapped toy, please do. And those we give to the uh, City of Forest Hill Police Department and Fire Department. And then they distribute it to kids that might not have a, uh, otherwise have a, a good Christmas. So December the 16th. You're probably going to see flyers being passed around through all the social media. So write that down. If you have grandchildren or other people that you know that would like to see our layout, please come by. Admission is free. Donations always accepted, but admission is free. Thank you, Dick. Yes, yes. You represent the, the club. Correct? Yes, uh-huh. And you the division. Yes. So when the Plano show comes, well, for example, I got some things I might donate to sell. Should I, should I donate them to the that club to sell? The Texas Western? Or, or to the NMR? Yeah, I mean, donate them to me. Yeah, yeah don't. <laughs> well, okay, look, they're, they're, they're books. And, and, you know, that, that stuff. So I, I don't. We, we have got a ton of books that we can't even sell. Right. Well, okay. so, And magazines, too. They well, just I don't sell. Some other things, too. But I just okay. want to. Brass locomotives will take. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's yeah, All right, but then who, who would you donate to the division or to, or to the... Well, uh, it, Who, it, whoever you would you like. like. Whoever you'd like. You don't, we don't have a table, do we? At, at Plano? Or no. We don't, but you do have a table? Yes, sir. Always do. Okay. And whoever, like Dick said, whoever you'd like to donate them to, uh, the funds will be greatly used by the club or the division for expenses, rent, other stuff, sound systems, what have you. Okay, one last question. Yeah. If, if I were to donate something like I have a real railroad, something, is there a way that we could split the proceeds? Or is it just all or nothing? Uh, usually what we do is if somebody wants to sell something there, they pay us a 10% fee. Well, I was thinking of donating and doing 50-50. You know? if, 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 if we sell it, 
uh, we get the the club gets the proceeds and excuse me, you get the proceeds and you just pay us ten percent. That's not what he's saying. He wants to donate it and split the money between the division. And the club. Oh, we yeah. could we could negotiate that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'd, I'd be willing. Yeah, to do that. that's fine. We'll we'll get David Grind involved yeah, we'll, and and he's. He's real good at math. He can divide by two. <laughs> real good. Okay. Did, you, did you have a question, Mr. Texas Tech? Uh, uh, yeah, I was just going to ask if Santa was accepting Christmas lists from adults as well, because I've got a few texts, and I okay. I've been good this year. Okay, you've been real good? Yeah, okay, bring your list, and we'll okay. see. Okay. Anything else? All right, Dick, it's yours. Okay. So before we go any further, I want to... Uh, you know, I think we all know it's Veterans Day, but I want to ask the veterans to please stand up and let's recognize them and thank them for their service. So veterans, thank you very much. <laughs> or a revolutionary war, as the case may be. <laughs> okay, and don't forget, uh, we do have a layout tour after this meeting. I'm not telling you, it's still a secret. Uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed Mark Armstrong's uh, layout that we went to last month, and um, hopefully you'll get a, you'll enjoy the one we're going to today. And it's relatively close, so keep that in mind. That's the riddle. Um, okay, I want to welcome the members that are attending uh, via Zoom. David, who do we have? We have Dwayne Richardson. Hi, Dwayne. How are you? Doing good. How are y'all? And Brian, hello. Good. Thanks for attending, or, and thanks for doing the clinic today. And we have the train meister. Yep. Good morning. Yeah. You can't hear me. No, we can now. Who is this? Okay. I said good morning. How are you doing? Fine. Who's your, what's your name? Lee Bangma. I'm Division Three. Okay, well, good. Welcome. And I guess that's it. We got three people. Close. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, welcome to the meeting, guys. Um. Okay, Chris Mahan, would you make? Uh, would you stand up and tell us how we're doing on our uh, module for the Plano Train Show? Oh, he's going to have trouble getting to the microphone. Well, actually, I can talk loud, except for Russ Hold on, hold on, Chris. Hold on, hold on. We got a mic for you. Hold on. Uh, the military taught me not to, not to need a mic. Lay it on the table. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hey, guys, I can talk loud enough. No. <laughs> okay. Can everybody hear me? Hold on. All right. Go ahead. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Division one and Division three have started a project um, to uh, increase interest in model railroading and the NMRA at the Plano Train Show. We're going to uh, work on a modular train layout. This will be four by eight. It will be built of four modular sections that hold together and electrically go together. And at the end of the show, uh, we're going to raffle it off. So if uh, People of the show are interested. We're going to ask them for a ticket. Uh, if they want to buy a ticket, uh, it'll be five dollars for one ticket and uh, twenty dollars for five tickets. But during the show, we're going to be working on it. We're going to be laying some track. We're going to be adding some structures and some scenery. Um, and the end of Saturday, we'll actually set it up to run. It will include a locomotive and probably four to six uh, freight cars. We need help 
because every 45 minutes, we're going to have someone demonstrating something, laying track, uh, working on a structure, um, adding scenery, adding roads, that type of thing. We've gotten two um, donations from Walters. They're build a world. We have the town, and we also have the farm. And so we're going to add those to the layout during the show. Uh, we'll also need a little help prior to the show to get some of the things done. So it, uh, we start with a, a base, uh, a halfway decent base. If you're interested in helping, please get a hold of me. Um, either um, uh, my number is on the Texas Western uh, um, roster, or at here, uh, give me your name and phone number, and I'll get a hold of you. Any questions? <coughs> are the modules pre-built? The modules are pre-built. The track will be laid. Uh, they basically, oh, the basic oval will be laid on them so that uh, on Saturday at four o'clock, we're going to bolt the four of them together and start running train and run a train. They'll be pre wired, uh, ready to go. <clears throat> but, <laughs> you know, the, uh, did you go the digital or is it going to be in the law? Uh, that's still up in the air. We're, we're working to get a donation of a uh, Digitrek Zephyr, uh, and if we do, we'll go BCC. What's that? HO. Thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you. How do I turn this thing off? <laughs> uh, David Grind, you want to give a treasurer's report to the division, please? Yes, I will. David, come up, come up, come up. I'm coming. Uh, look at this. I'm here all week. Tip your servers, please. Uh, our opening balance on October 1st was $3,100. We received three hundred and one dollars. We spent nine hundred ninety one dollars with a closing balance of two thousand four hundred and ten dollars. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Is this a five hundred one C three? Yes. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Gave us on the blind. Okay. Now, do we have any visitors or new members here today? If so, please stand up. Okay, no visitors, no new members. Okay, uh, then let's move on. Okay, let's talk about announcements and upcoming events. Um, in the region, we have the Houston um, Area Model Railroad Show coming up in November 18th and 19th. Keep that in mind. At the end of November, we have the uh, Rocky Mountain Holiday Train Show. Uh, that's on November 25th and 26th. And there is a website address on the um, con uh, on our division website for that one, as well as the Houston area show. And then, of course, we have the winter Plano train show coming up on January 20th and 21st. And, of course, that link is on the website, too. Now, in February, we have the uh, LSR convention coming up. And that's the, the name of it is um, Where the Eagle Meets the Chief. It's at the, uh, on February 15th through the 17th. Um, we got, they have registration includes layout tours, banquet, and a free, free, a free ticket to the Houston train show. So uh, there are three days of clinics at the um, convention. And you got, like I said, you have early access to the Houston train show and uh, a number of layout tours. So please sign up. I'd like to have a good contingent from uh, D1 attending. Okay, so now, Dwayne, you wanna talk? Uh, Mike's not here today. He's uh, out of town on uh, NMRA business. Um, so we won't have any regional or divisional AP talk, but Dwayne, you can do the regional? Yes, sir. 
Can you hear me okay? Yep. I hear you just fine. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, good news and great news this month. Uh, the missing certificates have finally showed up. Uh, I would have mailed these over for uh, in-person presentation. Uh, however, the, uh, the ones we got in from last month's submissions uh, only arrived on Thursday. So uh, I will be bringing those over, I guess, to the Christmas party. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as a follow-up, I uh, want to recognize those who will be uh, getting their certificates here at the Christmas party. Uh, Eric Smith for author. John Garfield got cars. Uh, Mike Armstrong got scenery. Uh, Chris Atkins for volunteer and for author. And uh, the biggie, Mr. David Crumpton, received cars and chief dispatcher. Certificates number six and seven. I'd like to recognize our newest MMR, David Crumpton, number MMR 747. He's our jumbo MMR. Well earned, sir. So his new alias will be Jumbo? Uh, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> it's either that or Boeing. <laughs> yeah. But congrats again, David. Well earned, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was fun. I bet you will. I bet you will say the same thing everyone else I've talked to has said. If you look back at what you built before and what you can build now, you're a much better modeler now than you were then. Yep. That's true. Very true. Okay, Dwayne. As long as you have the uh, the screen or uh, the microphone, so to speak, do you want to? Could you do a tip or trick for us today? Um. Yes, I've got I've got a tip. I haven't tried it yet. Um, there's been a lot of um, a lot of things on YouTube have become uh, a real benefit for modelers, uh, not just model railroaders out there. Um, typically, your uh, military modelers, the guys who like to build tanks and airplanes and things, uh, they have been a very tight lipped group. Uh, and you've heard me mention this before. I mean, they'll take whatever their little weathering secrets are to the grave. Uh, YouTube, however, has brought them out of their shell. Uh, it's given them a platform and they like to talk and they've been sharing a lot of stuff. Now, unless you're an O scaler or maybe even G, uh, a lot of the weathering techniques might not necessarily transfer into what we're doing. Because, I mean, in, in Z scale, it's you think about a little bit of weathering. In N scale, you do a little bit of weathering. In HO, you can actually start to start using some powders and things and maybe get a little texture with it. Uh, and then you can get a little more and a little more as you get bigger. Now, when you're doing tanks, the mud better look like mud. It better be 3D and it better look dirty. Um, but one of the big bennies on this has come out of the wargaming group. And that's where this tip, this tip comes from. Uh, people that like to paint Dungeons and Dragons miniatures and Warhammer 40K miniatures and things like that. And they're doing something a little different with their dry brushing than typically what we'll do. Uh, dry brushing techniques that we've always done is, you know, you get as little paint on the brush as you can. You wipe most of it off on a paper towel, you know, scrubbing it back and forth. And then you come in and you apply it and you're looking for streaking effects basically is really what you're looking for. Well, these guys take it a little bit differently. Um, and they're doing something that I've kind of been doing only uh, a wee bit differently. One of the things that they have is they will take a small tray. And I mean, maybe something four by six, you know, five by seven, something like that. And they'll actually glue down spare parts, just junk, leftovers. Um, and what they're doing is they're creating what they refer to as a wet palette. And then they will take a rather large brush, kind of like a makeup brush, only with the bristles cut shorter, and they actually get the brush a little damp with water, if you're using acrylics. And then they go in and apply a similar dry brushing technique, but instead of wiping it off on the paper towel, their, their consensus is you don't want the brush to be dry. Uh, you actually want the brush to be a little bit damp and you get a different effect out of it. So they'll take that little dry brush palette and they'll use it to get most of the paint off the brush until they're and it'll highlight things and get it to where they're, you know, to the level that they want the level of paint on the brush. And then they can take that over and apply that to their model. And their thing with this is not only for weathering uh, techniques or, or highlighting or whatever, they're actually applying the basic coat of paint in some cases like this. 
And this is something I've been doing with, uh, with a lot of my structures and things, especially wooden models, because you get a good coverage with very little paint. So you introduce very little water into the wood. So it's a variation on something that I've done for a while now, but I haven't tried it by making sure that, that brush stays damp and using a bigger brush. Um, I do have some parts and pieces I have gathered to make one of these little uh, little wet palettes, and uh, I will be giving this technique a try. I even ordered a set of the uh, brushes or a set of type uh, this type of brushes uh, off of Amazon. They're about thirty bucks, thirty five bucks. And I will be giving this technique a try as soon as I get an opportunity. I'll give you all some more feedback. Question, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is, 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 this, is this paint you're using, uh, is, is it uh, uh, oil-based or, or water-based? For this technique, it's, it's water-based. Uh, you could use thinner-based paints. Typically, with the oil paints, you're making washes out of those. So it's a little bit different. David, you, microphone. Hello. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Dwayne. Yes. What's the purpose you said in this uh, like wet palette? They put old plastic pieces or junk pieces or something. Did I understand? Yes. That? What's the purpose of that? Uh, instead of wiping off, it's a, it's a dry brushing, paint on brush, paper towel. This replaces the paper towel. Their, oh. their consensus is, is the paper towel sucks all the moisture out of the brush and it will leave you with a streaky, uh, and in some cases, three-dimensional. If you get, you know, a, enough of a streak on there and the paint is thick enough uh, that you'll actually get a, a, a little bit of a 3D deal. This, their contingent is by keeping the brush damp with water and then getting just a little bit of paint on there, it will actually lay down and uh, blend in a little better. You're also using the colors, um, you're mixing colors right there on the model uh, while they're both wet, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Dwayne? Okay, Dwayne, thank you very much. Oh, you betcha. Uh so uh, now we let's move into our question and answer period. Uh, I want to ask if anybody's having trouble with anything on their layout, what's giving you a problem? If you uh, talk about it or bring it up, there's a bunch of experts in this room that may be able to help you. Is this the ask part? Should yes. Ask? Yeah, Don, you can you can talk, but you got to use the microphone, Don. I will do that. Do I need the microphone now? Hold on. I'm going to bring you the wireless. No. So. Here you go. Hopefully it doesn't mess with my hearing aid. Um, I don't do a lot of this, but, but I have, you'll recognize this stuff. I have a number of engines, quite a number, and a lot of times I have duplicates. And, and I, I've gotten a reason. Hey, Don, hold the microphone up, Sorry please. About, I've gotten reasonably good at it taking some of the lettering off it the the uh number boards on for example these life lights um the light shines through and i'd like to be able to change the numbers and and i'm not exactly sure how i should go about that pop these little plastic things out and then remove the the numbers with however you do that with alcohol or something and then but but what do you replace it with? So and, and, and so hold on just a second. I have this I have this uh, micro scale thing here. So you want the numbers to show through, but you want the black around there. So you know if you're familiar with life like engines, uh, I'd like to get some different numbers on on the on this board. That's one thing. If somebody knows how to do that, okay. Why don't you just pause there for a second? Can somebody help them with that? So what? What do you? What? What? Okay. So you you use one of these on this micro scale thing? I can't see, but I see the black. The one the black background. Hopefully, those are the numbers. The black background, but the, the, the <laughs> white number is a see through. Yeah. yeah. It is a see through, not just white. 
Oh, yeah, oh, black covers it up, and then the lighting. I mean, you don't see the other numbers in the mom. They look great. Okay. All right. So, secondly, secondly, on this is a Walters model. Um, the number board here is number 43. And so, it, how easy is it just to remove 43 and keep the black on the back and just put another number on? I'm, I, I'm afraid that if I try to remove 43 that the black will come out is it also a bit where the light comes through no no this right is right on the paint i can't see it here. no no this no the, the light doesn't come through it's just simply a black background with a white number on top and i'd like to be able to just remove the number and replace the number <laughs> without affecting the black can't you paint it well i mean painting doesn't look quite as good as the way they've got it on there at least right, paint, paint the Take the number board black, then the white goes away, and just put a new white number on top. Okay. Well, I okay. I mean, I, okay. I I understand that. I understand. Well, yeah. The, the painting seems doesn't seem to look quite as good as the smoothness of the black background. That you know, I'm not being that picky, but but I, I sort of recognize that. But can can you remove just the white 43 number without affecting the black background? Does anybody know that? <laughs> So last no. night, I mean, literally last night, I was doing this exact same thing. It's what? Literally last night, I was doing this exact same thing. So it's all very fresh. So maybe I can tell you on one locomotive I did, the black came off on one side, and on the other side, it didn't. <laughs> so I got the tape out and the airbrush and the glossy black, and I did it a few times, and it covered up where the paint came off. It was perfectly for the decal. Okay. So all right. What David's suggesting, maybe your best approach. But you know, it's worth trying to take some off. And by the way, using solid sets, the paper towel that is the best approach. Um, okay, bye. Well, you can run it faster so people can't see what, when it goes by. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good alternative, too, Jim. <laughs> hey, and then last, I like passenger trains if anybody's ever seen this, uh, my layout. But I had this strange thing that happened. I, I picked up some cars and engines some time ago and it's called the Texas Star. It's a, an imaginary railroad, I guess. Anybody ever heard of that? The name of the passenger train? Yeah, the Texas Star. The Texas Star Railroad. I have a, a, a number of cars like that engine. Well, what I thought, and, and I bought it from a guy in Dallas and, and I thought, okay, somebody custom painted and did all this. And then lo and behold, uh, um, I encountered some additional engines on eBay for a guy in another state. And I thought, wow, that's weird because I would think this is fairly unique. So I, my simple question was, has anybody ever heard of this, of this railroad, Did Texas? Did Frisco have a train in Texas Star? It's, this is yellow and black is the paint color on this thing. So I think it's an imaginary, but I just, I, I just thought it was strange that someone out of state would have some engines for something that was done locally like that but nobody's ever heard of it yeah okay, this, that's all the this is brian uh it's Thank not you. unusual for manufacturers to make or decorate models for fictitious railroads because they have to make so many models and decorating is cheap compared to making the model and that gives them alternatives to sell so that very well could be a, a a fictitious railroad that what but those cars could have been in mass production i okay uh, i never seen any before and it, it appears in looking at the cars that this was custom painted i i it doesn't look like something that would have come out of a walters or a bachman or something like that i mean anyway, it was just a question who, if anybody who made the cars them. Bachman does this all the time. Oh, they do? Oh, yeah. Oh, Especially in ON30. Okay. Thank, thanks for your time. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you, Brian, for the, uh, for the input. Any other questions on um, what's giving you problems on your layout? Everything's work Everybody's layout's working fine? Yeah, I got a question about an engine, okay? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I got an MTH uh, G35, and the wiring inside is a use. Wiring inside, there's some uh, free wires, and I can't find out where they connect. Now, that, this little thing is got more wires in a car. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, but I can't find a wiring diagram. So if anybody has 
any info wiring diagram for MTH G35, uh, I can sure use it. I can't seem to get all the stuff. What? DCC or analog? It's DCC. Well, it's got a huge card and it just got to plug in DC. You could build DC with it. Can anybody help him out? Do you know who's the photo center? So MTH is proprietary. MTH is probably proprietary. When they hide, it doesn't follow MAR, NMRA standards, you know. It's kind of wires out and put it on the link. How about taking the photo out and putting it into the house? Okay, so uh, anything else? We good? Okay, so let's. Anybody? Uh, do we have something for show and tell today? Russell. Now make sure you use the microphone. Yeah, I heard y'all couldn't hear me in the past, so they bought this just for me. Um, yeah, Dave, do we need to turn that? It's already set. Okay. I started doing primarily now scratch builds with everything I do. What I do is I buy a kit, I steal the prints out of them, and I go buy the wood. And this particular is just part of the lumber yard. It was a JT kit that uh, is a JT Austin lumber yard. This is just a lumber rack. And one of the questions that I had when I was building this is I got to go buy a bunch of wood to fill this thing up. So Instead of going and buying a bunch of high dollar scale lumber, I just went to Michael's and bought a bunch of stuff that was pretty close and cut it up and made all the racks of lumber. Uh, it's all individual pieces. It's not something I built around. It's all piece by piece by piece. And um, it's got a felt roof on it. Um, kind of wear the things down. Uh, it's got a long ways to go. I wanted to put some pigeons on here and probably some old car tires holding stuff down. Um, and the weathering I've done on this, multiple, multiple layers of paint like I always do. I had a pretty good experience with using um, these decals. Uh, Give it a second. We'll focus. There just, we go. Just hold it still. Um, Y'all ever heard of Dave's decals? Yes. These are his weathered or his ghost decals. And they turned out pretty good. They look pretty good on the um, the wood, um, especially the Swiss beer one. But um, here we go. But it um, adds a little bit to it. But it's, um, once again, it's just a piece by piece build. I don't, I don't really like doing it this way. JT kits or regular flat drawings. I've got two George Celios kits I've done. One was the engine house and I'm building the depot right now. So what I do with his stuff, I make my own, I trace out and make my own blueprints out of that stuff. But anyway, it turned out pretty good. The um, walkway, all individual pieces of lumber all the way through. And I've just weathered it just to, uh, as our theme goes on our layout, it's old, but we, it's still good to use. Kind of like myself, I may be old, but I'm still useful. So anyway, turned out pretty good for what it is. Um, and I'm gonna try to have all this ready for the Lone Star Convention in February. So anyway, that's, that's it for the convention. I really like your weathering at the bottom of the building on the corrugated, oh, you know. Yeah, it's a wood siding and, and I've got pictures I can show you when I do, I stain below the paint before I paint it. And this on the bottom, the white's applied with a sponge and several really thin down white color. It's real thin and I'll sponge it on. And I always get my, you can see my hangover where the paint kind of stays on the, on the eve a little bit better, but it's stained with about three different colors of brown then a little bit of black, um, and it's just layer upon layers. This was probably, if I was to guess, 10 layers of, of paint as I build it up, trying to get depth when you look at it. The 
it's, it's not hard. It's just time consuming. And I, I see I'm getting pretty good results because the area we're modeling, which is the Black Hills of South Dakota, things weather differently up there than they do here because of the snow and everything else. The, the, you don't get the gray out as much as you get the black. But anyway, it turned out all right. Thank you, Russell. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, Russell, the ginger is from what company? Did you, uh, is it just ink or is yeah, it? Yeah, if you go to uh, Michael's or uh, Hobby uh, Lobby. Um, it's, it's, it's on Preston Road, it's 635, it'll come to the name, come to the name. Ansel or Ansel, Ansel Art Supply? Uh, no, it's not Ansel, it's not even in business anymore. Uh, I'll, I'll remember in a minute, uh, it's a big discount art spot. Okay. If you can buy the alcohol inks on Amazon, yeah. they're cheap. But the blending solution, if you're if you're trying to, like I'm doing hardwood floors or something like that, I'll use that blending solution, and it kind of draws the color to bring the grain up in the wood. Okay. Anything else, Eric? Okay, hold on a second. There's another question. Another question. I got something to tell, but not the show. Okay, stand up, David, please. If you model diesels on your layout and you have on your yard or engine terminal, uh, if you subscribe to Model Railroad Hobbyist in the Running Extra supplement, that's the part you have to pay for. Uh, in the upcoming issue, they're publishing an article I just wrote on modeling oily, greasy uh, diesel tracks. Uh, I gave big props to the division <laughs> in, in it. So um, if after reading it, if anybody reads it, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll be. I demonstrated this at the RPM a couple of months ago, and if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll be glad to answer your questions and help you. Correct. Correct. The issue that should be out this week. Not yet. Should be out this week, and it's in running extra. It's not the free one. It's the paid one. Okay. So, thank, thank you, David. Okay. Any more uh, show and tell items for show and tell? Yes, Eric. Russell, I'm going to move yours here. Um, I know I, I mentioned this at, at the last meeting, but I, Russell had already taken it to the car and um, that I had this jig that I made up if you can, for um, building cars. And so what you wind up with is, uh, figure out which side it's looking at. You, you come up by placing the strip wood in here and then gluing the ends and it's set up for a 30 foot and a 40 foot and then this is a modification from the one that I, I beta prototype with Russell this is for an HON3 with the the state places so it's narrower than a normal HO and then down here you have the siding uh, roof and then you have the end caps for the cars and then doors and then the walkways for the tops and and in the kit for building these i have a, a detailed instruction sheet that tells you basically what everything is and you just and it gives you the strip wood dimensions for doing ho and, and so huh this is 3D printed. It's PLA plastic. Yeah, it, it's uh, fairly thick. So, and uh, anyway, the, these, I don't have them available on my website, but if anybody's interested, just let me know. 
Um, if, if you're looking for building the cars, I mean, it, it helps you come up with, with the, the base for the cars fairly quick. Um, you can do a couple of these in an hour easily for the base of a car. And it makes sure that your your angles are straight, which is, for me was one of the hardest parts. It's the whole reason I built the jig. So. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Okay, anything else for show and tell? A hey, question from the peanut gallery, Eric. Where's your website? Um, I'll come back up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, scale railroad models.com if anybody's interested i can give you a uh, a business card and so or you can email me through uh, most of you get emails from me anyway you just respond to that email to me and and you can get to me so. yeah you can get hold of eric through the uh through groups io or groups uh, the uh or communication even, man or communication manager at group uh, Kyle Ketcher division dot org dot org right right is that right yes okay okay good so um one other time you have another yeah, question well, still real quick um you know track cleaning is, a, is an often discussed college. I like to use just for routine maintenance the vertical makes my track slider thing. Uh, I think some people say John Allen created this thing and whatever, but uh, it works very well in HO. It works well in HO and 3. I'm not sure there's enough vertical clearance on the bottom of an end scale car to get everything in there. But if anybody's interested, I was going to make kits and offer them to everybody here today. I brought a couple along, but if anybody would like a kit for making a base knife slider thing, uh, I, mean, I have I have a couple. Of, there's some interest. I'll bring some more next month. So. Okay. Thanks. Tom, thank you. Okay. Uh, so that kind of let's, uh, let's do this. Why don't we take about a 10 minute break and then we'll start uh, with our program or our clinic for this, this morning. And Brian, uh, thanks again for doing this clinic. We appreciate it. No and problem at all. we'll get back together in about 10 minutes. Uh, David Grind. Oh yeah. And, when we take a break, please uh, feed the kitty for your refreshments. Um, just keep that in mind. So uh, thank you very much. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll keep, pick it up right after the break. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody that we have some of the uh, wood kits that Wayne put together for. Some of you were not with us last week and didn't pick up your kits. We've got, I think, either two or three HO and one O that are still back there. And they're on the, the table, we'll $15, I think, for the HO kit and 20 for the O, I think that's right. I'll need to check the numbers out on that. Also, our um, for um, our uh, speaker is going to be Brian Bart, who's going to talk about the uh, um, NMRA standards gauge. A lot of the stuff that we, the reason we have a hobby today, a lot of it's actually got to be due to the standards that the NMRA has actually been able to uh, been able to uh, come up with. I mean, we have compatibility with equipment, and of course, all of us should be free from the military. You know, we join NMRA, and I've had mine for years, and I'm always using to check the actual with. Uh, Brian is on different committees with the NMRA, and uh, tell us a little bit about the history and what the significance is of this little metal gate that we all had. And, you know, basically, just got mine in my pocket over here. I kind of keep it always in my toolbox. Thank okay, you. very good, Jim and Brian. The floor is yours, and we're looking forward to the uh, clinic. Okay, there we go. So, I, as uh, as Jim said, I'm Brian Barnt. I've been a member of the technical department at the national level for well since 1993, and uh, I'm HLM 66. Uh, I've been a life member since '86. I've had all sorts of positions in the technical department. And uh, basically in 2004, I opened my mouth at a convention and got a job. I should know better. <laughs> and so I, I converted all of the hand-drawn gauge drawings to CAD and for designing the, the tooling. 
and uh, I can't seem to get away from it. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but I had to sit down and, and figure out how all these numbers worked together. So can you see my uh, shared screen? Is that coming through? Yes. yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure before I start <laughs> getting on a roll. I could see you guys. I have a couple questions for the for the audience. And I know Jim had his gauge there. What what mark gauge is that? Right on the front, it'll have a mark, a mark three, a mark four, four B. What gauge is that? I got a two. A six would be an N gauge. A Mark II. Well, that one's getting a little long in the tooth. That one's from the 70s, and the standards have changed since then. But as long as you build your railroad to that gauge, you'll probably be all right. <laughs> so it's over yeah, let's in the see. Tooth also. <laughs> so so the original NMRA standards, uh, as best we can figure from the records, uh, came out in 1940, about five years after um, the NMRA was formed. It took them that long to decide. So in the, the original standards were dimensions without tolerances. They were just numbers for the for the for the targets. And as HO grew and the number of scales grew, and TT was very popular in the 50s, um, there was a lot of math that had to be done. And the manufacturers wanted tolerances so they could, you know, they, they couldn't hit the target. So in 1959, uh, Ken Mortimer, who, I don't know, there's a lot of gray hairs in the room. Does anybody remember Ken Mortimer or Brad Bradley? Um, I don't know when Ken passed away, but Brad uh, passed away in 95 or 96. Um and they they led the technical department and what's called the great simplification of 1959. And that simplified or changed the way we stated the standards into from dimensions with tolerances into something called engineering limits. Now, an engineering limit, say you have a number plus or minus. Well, that number minus is the lower limit and that number plus is a maximum limit. And so it it made the, the all the math and the computation of the standards much easier to specify them as limits, because every manufacturer had different machines at different with different tolerances, whether you had plastic wheels or metal wheels or axles and so on. And uh, that's why uh, Brad always referred to it as a great simplification. So about that time. Um, the uh, uh, first gauges came out, the Mark Ones. I don't know if they were ever stamped Mark One. I've never actually held one in my hand. Um, they came out in the 60s. And the Mark Twos, uh, they were, they came out, I believe, in the 70s, but I, I don't have any records to show that. Um, I have the Mark Three drawings from the 1980s. We have the Mark Four drawings that were done in in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, the Mark IV B, for those of you with HO scale gauges that are Mark IV Bs, that was the first one. That was where I got involved and had to convert the hand-drawn uh, Mark IV drawings to um, CAD so that the tool makers could make the, the stamping dies. And it's all the same dimensions as the Mark IV. There's no difference. It's just a different set of dies because the, the tooling wears out about every 10 years for HO and N. And uh, so now we have Mark Vs are the current HO drawings um, or the gauges. And the N scale, whoever had that Mark VI, that's an N scale gauge. Um, that's the newest one. Um, I can't remember when that one came out, just in the past few years. Um, and we've rearranged a lot of these gauges these diff between these different versions, all the times and the measurements on the gauge. Sometimes we move the positions around. And that's the other thing that um, uh, the marks indicate is where the different times are on the different gauges. And I should say there are two types of gauges. There are square gauges 
and there's gauges that are the uh, silhouette gauges, the type twos. And uh, all the measurements are the same. It's just where you find them on the gauge are different. So let's start with track. It all starts with tangent track. And G min, the minimum G is what we scale down from four foot eight and a half to the prototype, from the prototype, whether it be H O O N T T S uh, Z, it all gets G min gets stale, scaled down to that, that value on tangent track. The, the next value um, that comes into play is G max. And if you were only running trains in a straight line, uh, you would never need G max. But when you start to, to curve the track, well, you have to widen the gauge a little bit because the wheelbase of the locomotives are, are rigid. And this is especially the classic example is the big boy. The, the wheels are so rigid, you have to have a wide radius. Well, you have to widen the gauge a little bit on that wide radius curved track to get your to get your cars and wheels so the flanges of the wheels don't bind on the rail as you're going around the curve. And if you've heard wheel squeal, that's what it is on the prototype. So if you look at the bottom of the, I'm going to talk about the HO gauge just in the end gauge, just to be um, consistent, but the same dimensions are on the S the old S scale, SN3, HON3, and um, they're all on there. Uh, so when you're checking G min and, and or checking G, you want to take the gauge and hold it upright and put it down in, in the left tine on the bottom. You want to press against the, the stock rail on the left and drop the gauge down. And if everything's in line, the, the gauge will sit square on the track, just like it's shown here. Is that big enough for you guys to see on the screen in the room? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's that's when it's correct. If the gauge is too narrow, that tine will hit the rail and you can't be down square. Or if you're beyond G max, the gauge will tip to the right as you try it because it hits this upper edge here. And that's, that's how you check G. Pretty straightforward. Lots of people use that. Uh, if, if they don't know anything else about it, that's the one they use the most. So, the next values talking about track that's important now come when you're looking at um, turnouts. This is good for ta tangent track and curves, but the at a turnout is where you get the most, the more most likely to get derailments. And the the values that the first value we'll talk about is C, the track check gauge, and that's the distance from the guardrail on either side of the outside rails of the frog to the inside. I'm sorry, to the point of frog. If we took a turnout and we cut it in half right right where the frog it's just rails come together that's what we're looking at here and so the check gauge is the distance from the guardrail to the frog and and the the reason this works is because the back of the wheel the the guardrail keeps the wheel set from picking the point of frog or going the wrong way in a turnout um, because of the guardrail. And the, the back of the wheel could theoretically um, ride right against the guardrail, but normally it doesn't. And so that C dimension, it, it, the check, track check gauge, is what helps that wheel travel through the frog correctly in the right direction. So the next value um, that's important there for the, as the wheel goes through the turnout is the span. So 
we've got a if you've got a wheel coming through the back of one wheel can't be it rides here and the back of the other wheel rides here by the wing rail on the frog well that value has to be uh such that the wheel set can span that without riding or rubbing up on the guardrail or the wing rail if you're talking about a, a guarded piece of track like a bridge rail across a bridge that has a guardrail and a, a guardrail on each side but for the for practical purposes on this drawing you could call that th that second guardrail a wing rail and that's what guardrails are for to keep to keep the wheels from riding up over the um, stock rails. So the, the, they, they keep the flangeway distance on each side. And the other thing that, that's important here to note is that right at the uh, point of frog, you actually have another flangeway here for the uh, opposite route. And, an, and another guardrail over here. Now we'd only draw half the picture, but if you, where this line is, if you imagine that there's a mirror image there, that's what's happening in the turnout. Um, and that, that's a, just before this point, there's two flangeways and we'll get to the, why that's important when we talk about wheels. And that's, if you've ever had a wheel drop into the flangeway, um, that means it usually means the guardrail is off or there's something else wrong. And that's a real big cause of derailment. Um, so the next question on the slide then is measuring C min and C max. So on the gauge, these are the tines that are at the top of the gauge opposite the, um, opposite the, the track gauge. And I've copied these pictures out of RP2. And so there's some extra here. We're talking about A, B, and C here. We'll talk about D, E, and F in a minute. But what you do to use it is you put one rail, one tine against the guardrail. And again, you want it to drop in such that it's a straight, that it's not riding on the frog rail or the point of frog or the frog rails or hitting on the wing rail. You want it to drop in correctly. So that's that does measures two dimensions. It measures the span and it measures the check track check gauge. While we're talking about track, there's a couple more important dimensions. We have H max. And H max is the flange weight depth. And the, this spikes if your hand spiking you don't want you, there's a maximum depth you can have that you have to clear a spike in this area that would be holding down the rail or you want the the, the flange in the frog this might be solid and you there, there's a, a maximum dimension you can go down before you hit the obstructions The other dimension is the width of the flangeway itself. Um, we talked about C and we talked about S. Well, also the width of the two flangeways um, comes into play that, and there's a maximum dimension there and a maximum dimension for S. And those two have to add up to C or just a little more or a little less um, for wheels to travel through the, the frogs correctly and those are measured uh, uh, in this on the gauge the flangeway depth um, is also part of the the check gauge you can use those same two top tines to measure the depth the the minimum depth of the flangeway if you um, when you're checking for the maximum width on the upper left angled part of a metal gauge, an HO and N. Um, some of them are labeled no-go. 
There's another time, and sometimes it's uh, on the Mark 3s or the uh, Mark 2s. It might be in the middle of the top. And that's to check the width of the flange way. If the, if the flange, if the tab drops in between the frog and the wing rail, your flange way is too wide. The, the, the text on the metal gauge in this area is labeled no go because both of these, uh, the tine and the slot are used, or if, if it goes somewhere, it's a problem. So the most correct part is that that tab doesn't drop in between the frog and the wing rail. One last turnout dimension is P max. And this is now back at the throw bar of the turnout. We have to, we have, to have P set so that if the points are one way, the wheel can travel through here. If the point is set with this against this stock rail, the wheel has to travel between here. Um, there are actually two P dimensions that the gauge measures. It'll measure the mechanical clearance and it'll measure the electrical clearance. And to do that, um, you use, whoops, sorry. On the upper right hand part of the gauge are two tabs. And on the inside, it's really hard to see here, but there's a step right here on the inside and there's a step right here on the outside. The inner steps are to measure the point width for electrical. And the, this height is half the flange way, so it's a little tricky to measure. But the point, the again, the points you should be down and even for electrical clearance all the way across. If the points are too wide, then the tine is going to hit, and that's not good. So, and, and remember, you're always holding the gauge against the point rail on the opposite side where you're measuring. That's what all these little arrows are for, which way to push gently. If you need to, it's not so much an issue anymore, but if you need to measure the mechanical and electric, the electrical, if you're clear, if you want to check the mechanical, that's the, the little notch here. There's not, there's five thousandths clearance, about three human hairs difference. I, some, when the gauges get worn, I can't even see this notch, but you can feel it if you run your uh, nail along the tab. And that's just a little bit wider and checks the mechanical clearance. You're not down tight against the gauge, but you're up half the flange depth. Um, so um, those are all the track measurements you do on the gauge. So any questions so far? If not, I'll carry on. We'll talk about wheels because if you don't have track and you have no wheels, you don't get anywhere. So in wheels, we have a bunch of dimensions and they're all kind of shown on the same diagram. We have, we have the check gauge, we have the back to back, we have the flange depth, tread width, wheel width, and flange width. So when we're talking about track and we're talking about C, we have to talk about its opposite for the wheels, which is K. And as it turns out, because the flanges are tapered and the wheels are usually tapered a little bit, we can set the maximum K to the minimum value of C. So, and that's from the rail side of one wheel flange to the back side of the opposite wheel. Um, then, the other value that comes into play is B min. And that's the back to back difference. This, this is wheel sets get way out of whack when they have, it's easy to measure this back to back. If you, K is pretty much fixed by the wheel, but you can slide the wheels on the axles and fix the back to back to help your derailments. 
And to measure those on the gauge, on the left side of the gauge, are two notches, or in the case of the new Mark VI, there's only one notch. I'll explain in a minute. So when you when you uh, you put a wheel set on, you have to push the one side against the inner part of the slot to measure correctly. You can't hold the gauge up to both wheels and say, yes, both wheels fit in here and it's good. You have to push that gauge either left or right, depending on, on an HO Mark V, which uh, B-min and K-max you're measuring. As long as both flanges fit in the slot, uh, or fit when one is tight against the other, you're good. If you're too wide, this tread, the, this uh, flange will not fit down in the slot. Conversely, if you're too too narrow, you'll have that problem here. So you want the wheels to drop down. What we found in modeling with the masters is that a lot of guys are checking this wrong. They're just holding up the gauge, as I said, and they're not pushing the gauge tight against one wheel set or the other. So the powers that be said, well, get rid of the second slot. So on a, on a Mark VI end scale gauge, there's just a little notch over against the tab so that at the bottom of the gauge and this whole slot is moved down on the gauge. So there's you have to turn the gauge around to measure the opposite wheel and you always have to put it tight against it. Um, and that's the difference between a Mark V and a Mark VI. The next dimension on wheels that come into play is the flange depth. And flange depth um, is the opposite of H on the track. The flange depth on a wheel can't be any more than the minimum value of H. So this is the maximum flange depth, the D max, is to keep the keeps the tread from hitting a, a, a or the not the tread the flange of the wheel from hitting obstructions the um d max changes based on very much so based on fine scale standard scale um, proto and deep flange but we'll cover that too in a few minutes so the other dimension that's important is N min. And if we think about as the wheel is riding through the through the frog, right before the point of frog, you've got two flangeway widths. <laughs> that N the wheel width has to be enough that the outer edge of the wheel going through the frog has to ride on the opposite ring wing rail to support the weight that's what happens in the prototype that's what we have that's what we have happen if the if n is too narrow even if the flanges work you can drop you can theoretically drop the wheel into the frog and derail again we're trying to get good track work here so this is the bottom row now of that same diagram we looked at before you can check D max in 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 D here and make sure that it drops in uh, or it has the right, it's not, this doesn't touch here. Um, and then up on the upper left corner uh, or, or angle is the notch I, I spoke about earlier. If the wheel goes into the notch, the tire is too narrow. If it rides, if it just touches or just rides on, uh, it's correct. There's no standard for the maximum wheel width. You could make pole road wheels, really wide real wheels if you had a reason to. Wouldn't affect the track work. So that's how you measure D N min and D max. So that's actually all the track, all the times on the metal gauge, how we use them and what they measure. 
So we can talk about clearance gauges and the NMRA, the original design for the type two gauge um, has the silhouette for bridge clearances and platforms from scaled down from the A R E A 1940, 50-ish standards. And uh, that works for many things. For a long time, people have been saying, well, the AREA American, I should tell you who that is. That's the American Railway Engineering Association that decided bridge clearances and platform clearances as opposed to cars, which is the AAR. Now, five, 10 years ago, they combined into the same organization. So it's all AAR now. But the the, the standards they had the in the 20s, they changed them in the in the 40s, they changed them in the 60s, they changed them in the 70s and early 80s. Um, the most recent change was for double stacks to give you the height of a double stack. And since a lot of new and younger modelers want to model what they see, um, double stacks, people have been complaining since the late 70s. We don't have a gauge that measures double stacks. I buy a, a bridge kit, I run my double stack through and it hits it or your signal bridge or whatever. So that's why we came up with the clearance gauges. And clearances don't have us anywhere near the tight tolerance that um, the track work does. And so we can do this in plastic. And so I don't even remember what year now, 98, 99, 2000. Um, I model was modeling ON30 and went, there's no gauge for this clearance. How I, I'm used to HO, I can eyeball that. I can't eyeball O scale narrow gauge. So I designed the plastic, um, what, what has become the plastic ON30 gauge first. And the, it uses the center hole of the metal gauge to align. I'll talk about that in a second. But there's ON30, there are ON3, and those are orange. There's HO Modern, yellow, and N Scale Modern, blue. Um, it was kind of funny when we were talking about, I was on the phone with the technical department chair at the time, and he says, well, I have to call. The guy was my business partner in the HON30, Alan Pollock, and find out who did all those drawings. And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> I did them. So we we did HO and modern and N scale modern. And they're yellow and blue. They're all different colors, so you can tell them apart. On those plastic gauges, if you get one, there's two sides. And the, in the middle, there's a pin. And the pins are offset. And the reason for that is if you put the metal gauge on in the storage position, the tines for the track are above the bottom of the gauge to protect it. You put a clamp on it, you put a rubber band around it, throw in the toolbox, it won't get damaged. Um, on the opposite side, the measure side, you turn it around, the pin is down, and those tines stick down below the bottom of the plastic gauge. And so you can align that gauge in the center of the track and check the clearances around. That was the, the basic design. Um, I turned all over all the intellectual property of the NMRA. It all belongs to the NMRA now. But we could do modern for any scale or any gauge. Um, 3D printing them doesn't really work because they've got such a thin profile. Um, but um, it could be, um, could be done. So they're all injection molded by an NMRA member who is also a molding manufacturer. So I talked earlier about the, the deep flange and fine and proto, and a lot of people are surprised that we have four standards for HO. And the reason we do that is, is kind of scale fidelity in history. So, before there were ever proto scales, we had standard scale, the standards, standard scales, HO standard, and these are all um, like S3.2 and S4.2, the standard scales. And 
some of the dimensions there are not scaled directly from the prototype, but they're about 200% oversized because of the manufacturing. So they could be manufactured, um, especially in the 40s and the 50s. And um, so those are about 200% oversized. Fine scales um, are in HO and the smaller scales that you can't quite do proto in yet, although I believe it'll happen someday. All the narrow gauge scales are fine scales. Um, they wanted more prototype fidelity than standard scales would do. Um, there weren't a lot of operating layouts historically in the narrow gauges um, or well run operating operations on narrow gauges. Um, and so we had the fine scales. In O and S, for many years, we had prototype scales where we take the dimensions from the prototype and we directly scale it down into the scale. And that's what we have. So we have a flange depth of an inch. We have a flange width, width of an inch and three eighths. And let me tell you, in HO, it's really fine. Uh, on the opposite end, we had deep flange where the flanges are much deeper than standard to help the trains stay on the track. And this primarily comes from Europe. And I asked the European managers, why do you make trains with such deep flanges? And they said, so you can run the trains really fast and they won't derail. And I went, okay, you have a reason in the customer base, but I, I prefer standard or fine myself. So that's the difference between the four scales and eight, the overlap is in HO. There's an HO scale for every one of those. When we started talking about revising the standards in 2004, they went, why do we need HO fine? HO standard gauge fine, four foot eight and a half. And I, can't we eliminate it? I'm going, no, you can't do that because all the narrow gauges are fine scale any dual gauge turnout you build has to have HO standard gauge fine dimensions or you can't build a dual gauge turnout. So that's why how we ended up with four scales in HO. Um, this is every dimension in the standard comes from four engineering assumptions. Um, we get, we have to make some reasonable estimates or assumptions to even start calculating the track wheel relationship. And those are G min, which is usually just scaled straight down from four foot eight and a half or three foot if you're doing three foot gauge or two foot, or if you're getting really weird, you can scale it down from any any dimension. And then N min, uh, a typical prototype wheel is five inches wide and N min is scaled down and it's, but it's usually about 150 to 200%, depending on whether it's fine or standard of, of that five inch standard. Um, and then we take a, a, a swag at B min. Um, the, Flanges the, the, on the wheels are normally an inch and three eighths. And so if we did some real quick math, just for fun, let me pull up my calculator here and say 1.375 divided by 87.1 for HO gives me roughly 16 thousandths clearance. And 16 thousandths is about half the thickness of that gauge. Um, that the, you guys had in your hand. <laughs> and so we're not, if you, if proto scales, especially in HO, have really, really thin flanges and they're not very deep. They're only an inch deep. That's even smaller for the B, D max. But we take those four assumptions and we calculate all the other values in the gauge. And those I mean, doing this in the 60s, but pencil and paper, was, I can't imagine doing it. Now we have spreadsheets and we can make mistakes at lightning speed. So every scale engaged follows the track wheel relationship. 
Track standards influence wheel standards. Wheel standards influence track standards. So as I was saying just before, in 1959, they had it calculated all by hand. In the 80s, um, they had a, Brad had a handheld calculator with a printer and he had a basic program that would print out a little paper tape like a, a adding machine tape. And I have copies of, of all the standards values that he ran through that basic program. And now uh, we have spreadsheets and we can make mistakes at the speed of light and publish them to the world when they're, when you make one. And uh, just, uh, I'm not sharing. I have a I have the spreadsheet open behind PowerPoint, but I won't show it. I'm working on an updated spreadsheet to calculate standards RP the all the standards, all four standards, RP25 uh, and RP25 plus all the technical data behind it in one fell swoop. But it's a multi-year project and it's got to be checked. So that's my uh, task for the next few years. Any questions? How do I get a copy? Of? Your presentation. Um, you can ask me. Uh, I am trying to update this and make it a, a, a clinic through the NMRA. Um, there's some more information I want to fill in and add, but this is the basic one that I've written up. Um, if you want to send me an email to, I should put that on here. That's a good one. It's tech, T-E-C-H dash E-L-E-C at NMRA.org is my technical department email. Jim has it. He also has my personal email if you need it. Jim, you're free to give them both. So, yeah, that would be a Mark one if it had. I, I, I'm not sure if there were any Mark twos with nothing on them. Um, two, three check technical department chairs ago, Carl Smeeg, uh, he's been working in the with a contest department now that he stepped down as technical department chair. He managed to collect all four. Mark all the all the different HO gauges, but I have not seen them yet. And he was so busy with modeling with the masters down at uh, the national there in Texas. By the way, great had a great time down there. Thank you guys. You were part of that. And uh you're very uh, welcome, Brian. Yeah. And uh uh so I haven't he didn't have time to show me the Mark Ones, but uh I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get closer to the microphone because I didn't hear. I, I could hear you talking, but I couldn't understand a word. I'm right on top of it. Oh, that's, that's good. Go ahead. So on the Mark 1s at the top on the flange right is a middle tab. And yes. And I what that was used for. That is F-Max on the, on the current... Uh, we've actually on the Mark V, we moved it back, but on the Mark IV, that's up in the upper left, that tab. And that tab is used to measure the flange way um, width. If that tab goes in between the rails, your flange ways are too wide. If I, we'll see if I can back up. Came in. Yeah. So, with that that tab that's in the center is shown on a mark four as being on the angle when it's really right here in the middle here that's the difference we that's one of the differences between the the early gauges and the the mark fours and i i think the mark three had it in the center but the mark four and and four b moved it over here to the side and then we moved it back on the Mark V, which I think was a mistake. So on the Mark VI, I put it back over here. Uh, we don't have a Mark VI HO gauge because the tooling to make the HO and N scale gauges is out freaking outrageous. And the tooling lasts for 10 years before it wears out. 
So uh, we don't revise them very often. Can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. All right, good. So I have an N scale standards gauge 4B. N scale 4B, yes. Attached to the blue clearance gauge? Sure. Okay. Which in side? That, in that package, here's here's the comment, really. In that package came the recommended practice RP2. A very old axle, copy of our, uh, a I'm very right, old. Right. Yeah. Pardon me? Probably a very old copy yeah, of RP2. <laughs> yeah, it's been updated since. Just right, recently. It, se it seems to, okay, well, I guess the question is, is all the information you just gave on the NMRA website? Yes, it is. And RP what, two? RP2 has was where all these diagrams came from. Uh, they really, I, I, I think I'm, I, as I was doing this presentation, I thought I should write an article for the NMRA magazine about what these letters mean and where, how they fit to the gauge. And uh, I'm thinking that's- Yeah, but I'm just saying that if- that. The, All the information, before, all the information before, is in RP2. Someone or, asked before for a copy of your presentation, isn't it RP2? Everything that's in my presentation is in RP2. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yes. And keep in mind, we're recording this presentation, and so it'll be on the website in a few days. Also. Yeah, if you, please send me a copy of that link so I can share it. So. Yeah, it'll be, uh, Brian, it'll be on the Division I uh, uh, website in a few days. Okay. And your your Rocky no. What region are you? Say it again. What region are you guys? Lone Star region. Lone Star. Region. Lone Star. I was having a mental block. I kept thinking Rocky Mountain, and I knew that wasn't right. Brian. Yes. It's going to be on our own the division. YouTube channel, Cowcatcher Division One. Okay. And it'll be just under the November 2023 meeting. Yeah, uh, the 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 way Jim and I got hooked up for this clinic was uh, he had talked with Andy mm -hmm. Zimmerman, the technical department chair, and then Andy was tied up, and then Mark Chewett if you guys know, writes the DCC column in the NMRA magazine, yes. his his actual position is conformance and inspection. He was tied up this weekend. And I said, they said, would you do this? I said, sure. <laughs> I, I, I had to figure out all these numbers. Um, I can talk about, I didn't put RP25 in this clinic, but I probably will add that. Um, the uh, RP25, it took me almost 25 years to figure out the math behind it because it wasn't written down anywhere. And uh, that's uh, one of the problems with the, that the NMRA has is that the guys pass away unexpectedly. And <laughs> um, Ron Gaines, the first technical department chair I had, I talked to him on Thursday. He said, stop by the hobby shop and see if they have any Union Pacific Proto 2000s. And on Tuesday, I got the phone call. He was dead at 39. Jeez. You know, just stunned. Uh, yeah, you know, and I won't go into the long details, but a lot of times that he had some prototype clearance cars that he had shown to the board of trustees. And he and I had shared a room at the National that year and I had seen it. It was gone. I have no idea where that prototype went. Hmm. And the same thing happened just, just recently. Um, uh, Larry e Eggering was the uh, DCC working group chair and last January we were in Springfield uh, Massachusetts for the Amherst show which if any of you guys make it up to the Amherst show it's well worth the trip to Massachusetts in January and uh, had dinner with him Sunday morning he was flying out early to go to his granddaughter's birthday party 
and got a call. He wasn't answering his phone and his wife reached out. He had passed away Sunday night, wow. 64. Um, okay. Luckily we have, we've learned our lesson in the technical department. We have all of the information that we've collected through the years is now stored online by multiple people. So we don't have to worry about losing data off somebody's computer. Well, very and, good. Brian, any more, any more questions for Brian? Okay, uh, Brian, thank you very much. It was very informative. We learned a lot. Yeah, I, I th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, if you have any more questions or anything, you can email me at the NMRA address. If you guys post any, usually if you post electrical questions on the uh, NMRA website, eventually it ends up with me. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it takes two or three weeks to go through everybody that goes, I can't answer this as, and eventually it gets to ask Brian. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate the opportunity. Like I said, had a good time at the national down there and uh, you guys enjoy your layout tour. Thank you, Brian. And also, would you let go of the presentation? Mode, oh, I'm please? sorry. Yes, I can do that. And have uh, a good day. Thank you again. Yeah. Let me see. Let me figure out how to do that here. Okay, so um, the layout tour is at the Cowcatcher, Cowtown Model Railroad Club. Okay, so I have ad uh, addresses for that. And I'll tell you what, if you just take one tab and pass it around, okay, there's multiple. Then there's multiple copies. Tom, would you take a tab and then pass it around to everybody who wants to attend? Okay, is there anything uh, anything else? Uh, okay, so that, that concludes the meeting. Uh, don't forget the Christmas party coming up the second Saturday evening in December, and we will have the uh, White Elephant Chris gift exchange at that too. I know you're all looking forward to that. Please bring your spouse to the meeting. Christmas dinner takes the place of the regular meeting. Yes, it does. Yes, it does.